Welcome back to the next session at the ISNTD Festival. Uh, we've been live with the 2021 festival. It's this for two days now. It's the second day. And uh, we're kind of working our way through a huge range and variety of issues around how to best communicate and how to best use creative tools um, to support global health programs and in particular neglected tropical disease programs and also research. So this is a really exciting session because um, in the next 90 minutes we're going to be looking at some very concrete examples of this sort of work and how creative approaches really can be embedded or in fact precede and prepare um, global health, public health approaches and disease control. So we're really looking forward to it. We've got a huge amount of material uh, ahead of us. We're going to be uh, looking at film, but also animation. Uh, we're going to look at lo lots of different types of creative visual methods. Cartoons will be traveling to uh, Liberia, Nigeria, lots of different areas. Um, so it's going to be really, really exciting. And it wouldn't be this wonderful panel without our great panelists. And so uh, straight away, I'd like to introduce everyone uh, who's joined us here today to share their work. Um, some of you may have been here since the morning, so you will already have met and be familiar with Dr. Leanne Kremers. Uh, Dr. Kremers, you're from the uh, University at Amsterdam, and you're going to be speaking to us about your ethnographic film uh, focusing on podokoniasis. We're So hi, Leanne. Hi again. We're also joined by uh, Boluwa Tife Adirunmu, um, you're a medical student at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, and you'll be talking to us about your fantastic animation about dengue fever and what we need to know. Uh, I'd also like to welcome very warmly Shireen Chowdhury. Hi, Shireen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Hi. You're, it's our very huge pleasure to have you here. You're representing Countdown, uh, the Countdown on NTD's program based at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, you're, we're also joined by Georgina Zavolo. Hi, Georgina. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hi, Georgina. I can hear you very well. And you're also with Countdown on NTD's uh, in Liberia. You're a lead social scientist. Uh, and we're also welcoming very warmly uh, Martin Imhan Soloeva. Um, you're with Sight Savers Nigeria. You're a research coordinator, policy and program strategy. And you're also collaborating with Countdown on NTDs. And you'll be talking to us about cartoons. So hi, Martins. Hi, everyone. Good Hello. to be here today. And thanks for having us. Super. So as you've heard, we've got a lot of material to get through. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Leanne. We've spoken about your approach and your film this morning. And so now it's the big reveal. We get to watch your film. And um, so I'll hand over to you, Leanne. And we're looking forward to finding out a bit more about the um, cre creating side of your film. Thank you so much. Um, so as I said already this morning, I'm a medical anthropologist, but I'm also trained as a visual anthropologist because I figured that um, film was such a powerful tool to, well, to disseminate your research findings, something that we all share, I think, everyone who is uh, joining in this session. Um, so uh, just like a little bit of background information about what visual ethnography is, because I'm not sure if everyone uh, knows this term. But the idea is that you do ethnographic research. You're going um, uh, into the field. You really get to know your respondents. You're building up relationships. And you're really partaking in their daily lives. Uh, the visual component is that you're actually, while collecting all this data, uh, you bring your camera. So you're filming everything. Uh, what you're doing in the field. And um, uh, I always took a very uh, interactive approach uh, and I gave my respondents a very active role. So I really wanted them to, um, to show me uh, where I should um, uh, 
orient my camera on and um, yeah, what the themes should be for an ethnographic film. Uh, some practical uh, information about uh, being a visual anthropologist. I bought a, a Canon XA20 camera, which is a digital camera. Uh, and um, in the field, I actually uh, like I worked um, for the film, I worked on my own. So I did the, both the camera and the sound at the same time. I did work with a, with a research team of translators and uh, um, we kind of jointly interviewed also with uh, my colleagues. And of course the respondents had this active role. So there was a lot of um, uh, work done by multiple people into the field and that requires a lot of multitasking. So I can, uh, I can say that at my first ethnographic, um, visual ethnographic research projects, that was a kind of a big challenge for me. But um, I also um, felt that when I came home and I had all this rich data on film, um, yeah, I, I really thought that was worth so much. And um, after the montage, which I also did myself, I screened it to various audiences to see like um, what kind of um, uh, idea the film communicated to make sure the representation of my respondents was uh, yeah was the way uh, I had intended. Um, so what we wanted to do with this ethnographic uh, film uh, entitled "Digest: The Story of a Girl with Polyconiosis." was to raise awareness uh, about polygoniosis, this neglected tropical disease, uh, but also to underscore the, the urgent need uh, for action because there's still a lot to do. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, me and the process of filming. And um, now I actually would really like to, to screen the film and because I'm very curious also whether you have questions afterwards about the filming process or about the content, of course. So, if it's okay, I'll move to the video. Enjoy. Tai 
Time, Marzag did it so back a lot to make a chin in decks. The back of Saugus in the Hanover Canal. The King Murphy ever kitchen will get out in a text. So I get time, Marzanity, be doppel with this. He got a condition. Tungison, where I didn't belong with a genie bucker. Tungison, I would send a bit of answer, Sahagi says in Oconchin. The red soil has silica particles in it, which cause swelling of the foot. Silica particles close the fluid system. When it starts, they have a, not only the swelling, but it is itching and burning. The skin really gets stretched very badly, so it will cause them pain. When there is the swelling goes on, there are some fluids coming out uh, um, between the toes, and the toes get stick together. The farmers get it because they go with barefoot, with no shoe, so their foot is exposed. <laughs> Many of the people, they are saying this is a, a curse from their forefathers or from 
the relatives or from anybody. And the others, uh, they were saying, oh, this disease is transmitted. Everybody in the community, even they are afraid uh, that uh, they are going to get, uh, if they sit uh, even with the polio patients, if they eat with the polio patients, and if they sleep with the polio patients, they are expecting that uh, it's coming to them. patients and some three or four million at risk as well. The swelling of their feet prevents them not to join the society, not to go into the social gatherings, not to farm. Sometimes even their family members are ashamed of this disease because they are neglected by their neighbors. They are ashamed of their neighbors. So they come to Addis to get away from the people, from their village, and to hide themselves where people don't know them so that they live like a normal life. <laughs> Surviving in Addis is a big problem. They will be on the streets begging They seek that and they expect the uh, living in the city or in towns is better than living in rural area. Even the poor patients, they can't get uh, good money. Even they beg uh, as the other beggars. So even to give the money, people, they don't want uh, to address them because uh, there is attitude uh, problem When our patients come very late to our clinic site, they are very shy. Uh, they seem like very hopeless and uh, they don't expect that uh, they are getting better even in the future. Mm -hmm. 
Podoconiosis is wearing shoe and again washing their feet and taking their hygiene very well. Our patients uh, mostly they come to our clinic site late because they are not aware about this disease. They were not educated. <laughs> Wow, that was incredible. Um, thank you so much for that film. Um, it's clear that it's immediately had an impact. Hindi Precious Fadele says uh, we do stigmatize people with one form or illness, um, of one form of illness or another so easily. The world needs to get better, really. It hurts. So, Leanne, that went straight to Hindi's heart and straight to our heart beautiful film and story says Martins and uh, what amazing lovely kind of uh, visual film but also um, the use of sound and music and also silence and thank God it ends well for TV. <laughs> <laughs> 
Despite that really stark figure of one in nine people in Ethiopia um, affected by podokoniasis, so um, that's that's really a um, stark figure there and um, much left to do. So Shireen, you're going to be talking to us about the use but also the value of visual approaches to advance NTD programs. That's right. So what I'd like to do is really just give an introduction before my colleagues Georgina and Martin speak. Um, let me just share that you can, well, check that you can see my screen. Yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. And thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm Shireen Chowdhury, as Marianne just introduced me to. Um, I'm a researcher and I work on the Countdown Programme, uh, which is an implementation consortium working to improve NTD service delivery. And today I'll be introducing some of the studies that we have been working on in Countdown that have used visual methods in Liberia and Nigeria. We'll start with a brief introduction to these methods. Global health agendas and interview program priorities are often dominated by academics and higher levels of the health system, while overlooking the needs of marginalized groups, such as people affected by NTDs. Creative participatory methods can be used to promote engagement and interaction of persons affected by chronic morbidity and disability in co-designing solutions. These approaches aim to foster group participation and inclusion while promoting accessibility of research. This has resulted in thinking beyond written forms of presenting data. Participatory visual methods include a wide range and variety of techniques that involve people whose lives are fundamental to the research to take part in the production of creative outputs that are used to present their lived realities, their experiences, perspectives and knowledge. Examples of visual methods we have used in Countdown include photos, drawings, body mapping, cartoons and film. This list is not exhaustive, but these creative methods allow forms of expression and enable participants and wider audiences to understand and explore different ways of seeing and understanding perspectives. These outputs can therefore be exciting and innovative platforms for knowledge translation and discussion to action change. So when can we use visual methods? They can be used in data collection, analysis, dissemination, and research uptake. But the most important things to consider at any stage of the research is, how will it make research more inclusive and impactful? I'll just go through an overview of some examples of different types of creative methods that have been used in Countdown's research in the field of NTDs, which will be presented in more detail by Georgina and Martins. This case study in Liberia shows how findings from a project on community engagement were presented as drawings. You will hear more about how these illustrations were developed and used to generate solutions to bottlenecks in NTG service delivery by my colleague Georgina today. Following this, Martins will then present how cartoons were used to conceptualize main themes emerging from research in this study in Kebe and Benue states in Nigeria. And this was on access to healthcare for people affected by skin NTDs. This study used co-researchers, which included people affected throughout the research process. The findings from their research were disseminated as cartoons, which powerfully highlighted factors impacting access to care, including stigma and the burden on health workers. If you're in the earlier session on overcoming stigma today, our colleague Dr. Tosin presented our well-being study, where we used photo voice to understand the day-to-day -day experiences of people affected by NTDs and their caregivers in Nigeria. These booklets showcase photos taken by persons affected with skin NTDs. The photos aim to show the realities of people affected by NTDs through their lens and focus on multiple themes including stigma, psychosocial well-being and support. The photo booklets have been used to inform the co-design and implementation of support groups in partnership with persons affected and program implementers. You can take a more detailed look at these photo booklets as they are linked on the ISNTD website. Our project used visual methods in dissemination. So what is the purpose of it? Well, this includes 
awareness and knowledge, amplifying voices of marginalized groups so that researchers and funders can learn from their experiences and prioritize their needs in program and policy design. Capacity for action is a key goal here, encouraging community-led learning and promoting positive action. And finally, people-centered advocacy. These methods can be used as a tool for advocacy by bridging the, communi the communication gap and enabling knowledge translation. I will now hand over to my colleagues, Georgina and Martins, who will present case studies of how we have aimed to do this by using different visual methods and dissemination to improve and advance NTD programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shireen. So as part of Condom First Intervention in Liberia, where we looked at the perception and knowledge of community dwellers around mass drugs administration, and also those who are working with the NTD program, like the community drugs distributor, in terms of motivation, supervision, and incentives. Looking at those bottlenecks that were faced during the, the, the first phase of our project, we identified these bottlenecks and we came up with creative ways to see how best we can be able to share intervention and address health system challenges that are faced with NTD delivery in Liberia. We decided to use innovative visual methods to communicate research findings at different audience at different levels of the health system. And based on that uh, innovative method, we thought that it will support the development of solutions to existing challenges and to redress existing power imbalance in health system design. We use two different methods. We use the innovative methods looking at pictures. So what we did was to contact a local artist and then describe to him what we found in our study, looking at the different teams that came up in our study. So we had teams around awareness, we had teams around community and disease knowledge, we had teams around supervision. So we asked him to develop those teams according to what we found in our study. And these were taken to the community and the county level. At the national level, we used the problem tree. This problem tree is like a tree. In the middle of that tree, we have our major problem, which could be around our motivation or supervision. The bottom of the tree is where we have all of the problems identified. And then we ask key stakeholders to come up with creative solutions that we can be able to address the problem that, will, that, that exists. And that is the branches of the tree. So we use this tree to present our, our problem and then we ask for solutions and how we can uh, uh, find means to address these solutions at the county level. Just to give you a few examples of some of our pictures. So this picture is about awareness and it shows a different way in which the community members received information. So we took this picture to the community and asked them to tell us what they think about the picture and then come up with creative solutions on how best they would like to receive information. And then they came up with solutions around creating health clubs in schools and community. They also talk about their involvement in awareness activities and they would like to work with the community health team. They talk about creative solutions where they can perform drama, looking at side effects around mass stress administration, looking at creating more knowledge on the, 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 the different kind of conditions. And this could be done a lot at the marketplaces or in a big town hall where you have all of the community members present. This picture is a real nice one where we ask the community people to tell us what they think about this picture. And these were things that they told us to our interview, looking at their own knowledge about the disease condition. And some of them attributed it to like witchcraft or traditional belief. So there was a need for continuous awareness around MDA and around the disease, these disease conditions. And they also talked about the timing in giving awareness where people will be able to get more information about the disease condition. 
We also took pictures around availability, how people receive medication. So the first picture will show you that there was a fixed point where people go to a particular place, either at the clinic or somewhere in the town where they receive their medication. And the second picture tells you about community trust distributor visiting houses to give people their medication. So these two pictures were recommendations from the community to be able to receive medication. And the second picture mainly is, is it was recommended to be able to engage people with disability or elderly people who are unable to move from their houses to go to a fixed point to receive medication. So these were recommendations that came up that during mass dress administration, we should make use of fixed point and both house to house distribution. We also look at the timing of drugs and of, of the mass drugs administration in the different season that we have in Liberia. So in Liberia, we have the rainy season and the dry season. And according to our participants, they said that during the rainy season, you have more people staying at home. During the dry season, they go out on their farms to find food for their family. So they suggested that during the rainy season is one of the appropriate time for people to be able to access the medicine and for the medicine to be distributed. And they also talk about awareness, that this is another way that we could do awareness where you have more people in the community and you'll be available to get the information about my stress administration. Some people also talk about issues around accessibility and they say that even during mass stress administration, when people are not home, another solution could be to leave the medicine at the health facility where people can be able to access the drugs, those who miss out. At the national level, we use the problem tree. So this is an example of the problem tree, how we use it. This tree is, the problem on this tree is around motivation. So motivation for the community justice distributor. And we ask stakeholders to come up with creative solutions on how best we can motivate CDDs to be able to do their work effectively. And we came up with issues around financial incentives and providing rain gears and logistics for community justice distributor. We find this method very useful. Innovative method helps us to engage people, especially those who are affected by NTDs. It also helps to enhance the ability of actors across the whole health system to generate solutions to address issues or problems from research findings. And these solutions that we generated from our dissemination, we were able to develop a community-led intervention, which is now moving into our next phase presently, where we are going to develop a community monitoring team and work directly with the community to, to enhance mass drugs administration and to get full participation of the community. I think that the use of natural matter at all levels is important to increase knowledge translation from moving the community down to the national level and it helps to flatten power hierarchy and enable validation of resource dialogue and the creation of solutions at different levels of the health system. Thank you. I will now move to Mounty to continue with the presentation. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Martins from Nigeria. I'm going to be presenting on the use of cartoons to improve case management of NTDs in Nigeria um, using the case study. So um, just to give a background of this study, um, we know like we all know neg NTDs or neglected tropical diseases often affect the most marginalized and poorest communities in Nigeria, as well as in many developing countries. And Nigeria holds 25% of Africa's NTD burden. Um, for many people who are affected with these NTDs, they often lack access to um, disability and disease management services. And this can often result in significant physical as well as psychosocial impacts, including mental health challenges. One of the things we wanted to do with this research was to explore the various barriers to access to health services for those persons who are affected, and more importantly, how we can use these findings to plan new strategies for updating the program, particularly as it relates to MMDP. 
Um, we conducted a study in two places in Nigeria, which is Kebi State and Benue State. Now, these are two regions in Nigeria that are um, the North, Northern region as well as um, the South southeastern region and we wanted to get the different perspective around these two settings next slide please um we, we use the part community-based participatory research approach to to explore the experience the lived experiences of persons who are affected with entities what are their challenges to assessing healthcare and more importantly we also assessed um we also discussed with care providers, frontline health workers, where we also wanted to understand what are their various experiences providing these MMDP services. Now, frontline health workers, as well as these persons that are affected with entities, we actually recruited as co-researchers. And that's one of the interesting things about community-based participatory research approach. And then these persons then went ahead to facilitate both the collection of the data, as well as the analysis of the data that came out of the research. Now it was all qualitative in approach and all the participants were involved in all of the process of designing as well as collecting the data as well as in the analysis of the research finding. Like you can see in this, um, this diagram, it was an iterative process where we started off with the observe and then we reflected upon the findings and then we planned an intervention that we then wanted to act on and then observe and then create this, another circle where we, you know, sort of observe, reflect, plan and act. Next slide, please. So from our first, from our first formative research, we were able to conduct about 53 in-depth interviews and six FGDs with persons who are affected with NTDs, where we were trying to detail the lived experiences of these persons that are affected with NTDs, as well as their caregivers. We also conducted 24 focus group discussions with community healthcare workers to understand the barriers that are experienced as they try to provide healthcare services to these persons affected. And we wanted to also understand from their perspective, what are their unique challenges that they encounter when they provide these services. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see, when we had, after the research, after the data collection and the core analysis with our core researchers, we then looked for a, we worked with the local site, um, cartoonist in Nigeria, where we developed about 10 cartoons that represented different thematics along the Levesque pathway. As you can see from this diagram, the Levesque pathway looks at um, two perspectives of healthcare delivery. It looks at it from the supply side as well as from the demand side. From the supply side, we developed each cartoon along the various themes. One of them that speaks to approachability, you know, acceptability of the services, affordability and appropriateness of services from the healthcare provider perspective. Why from the persons to our affected perspective, we explored certain barriers that pertain to ability to seek, ability to, to reach the healthcare settings, ability to pay for these services, as well as ability to engage the former healthcare services. Now in the, the design of these cartoons, we're actually very iterative, where we work with both our co-researchers who were persons that affected entities to help them to see these cartoons and then give us their feedback as to if they thought that that particular cartoons reflected the findings that we had gotten from the research. And when we had finished this, we conducted a dissemination meeting with um, program planners as well as program implementers, where we then sat with them to really explore using these cartoons, the various things that came out of research. We were interested in looking at all these various themes that I've earlier mentioned, and then we were able to come up with um, 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 kept come up with ideas as to how we wanted to take take the take an intervention for next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So, like you can see from this find from this picture, um, this is. This was where all the stakeholders, which included the program planners, as well as our co-researchers, really sat down together to look at the pictures that had come out of the research, as well as begin to look at how can we begin to design intervention that are in direct response to the findings that came out of the research. One of the interesting things about this um, method of using cartoons for, for disseminating research findings was that people found it to be very interesting 
But importantly, it broke down the power hierarchy as people found it easy to really interact and engage with the pictures. They also didn't see the cartoons as really trying to critique their own program. For example, here talkers trying to feel as though that we were producing results that directly criticized their, you know, their services as they tried to provide the services. But rather it was really about speaking to the cartoons and really trying to say, what does this cartoon say? What does it represent? And what do you think we can do better as a way of trying to better things? Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Okay, at the end of our dissemination meeting, um, our co researchers formed what you called an intervention planning group where they sat down together to prioritize what are the two areas that they thought were most important to addressing the challenges and barriers to head, to head seeking for persons that are affected with entities. Now, the interesting thing about these two areas that were prioritized, which actually were to revise the IEC materials that were currently be used to disseminate and create awareness about entities at the community level. But it was that they also wanted to integrate some of these cartoon findings as some form of IC materials to really showcase the different challenges of persons that are affected with entities and how people can actually support these persons that are affected at the community level. The other intervention that they wanted to also take forward was actually the revising of the training materials for headwalkers for effective entity case finding, as well as capturing additional issues that centered around gender as well as mental health sensitivity. Now, this was interesting also because, you know, some of the cartoons were again being considered for adaptation for these training materials. And like you see from my other slide, from my next slide, we're gonna be talking about this a little in detail. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Okay, so this picture you can see here represents one of the posters, which is an IC material that was developed. And the, our cartoon illustration from the research has really been adopted for use in the design of this poster. Now, this poster is what we have, you know, like you can see, speaks to the various aspects to entity, talks about what are entities really beginning to address what are some of the misperceptions about the causes of entities at the community level. It also speaks to the issue about stigma, you know, helping people to understand the person that affected would encounter stigma and that they will need to do well by not stigmatizing them. Now, these posters are going to be distributed at the communities where they will be used to raise awareness about the various entities and um, how they can also support persons that are affected to get proper medical care. Now, it's interesting to know that also this poster is, you know, was also, uh, it's also currently being validated and evaluated by at the community level. And the preliminary findings is showing that it's really very interesting. It's really colorful and it, it, it presents um, very interesting depiction of what is, what they would really like to see. Next slide, please. In addition to, uh, in addition to, in addition to our IEC material, we also have a very short one minute clip of a comic video that we have put together using uh, cartoon illustration. Um, just similar to the poster, it really speaks to the various aspects of entities and how that persons in the community need to support persons that are affected. Now this very clip is going to be shared using peer-to-peer -peer sharing devices like Bluetooth, but also simple social networking platforms like WhatsApp and other social media platforms. Now it's important that we also leverage on the internet as well as smartphone penetration that is actually growing in Africa as well as in Nigeria. So we believe that this is going to serve as another tool that we are using to really disseminate the findings of this research, but more importantly to, form, to promote entity case findings at the community level. Next slide please. Um, Additionally, we have also integrated some of these cartoon illustrations in our healthcare training guide for health workers. Now the healthcare training guide, although we already have some that exist that really are used for the training of health workers, but this time around um, the, the training guide really adds on some additional components around gender sensitivity, as well as some mental health constitution. But we also have used some of our cartoon illustrations to depict some of this point, also trying to help health workers to um, understand the causes of disease, being able to identify um, cases of entities in their community and also helping them to um, um, carry out proper identification and also referrals. Next slide. Um, this is the, 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 the inside 
page of that healthcare training materials. Like you can also see a cartoon illustration also utilized in, in this um, training manual. Next slide. Um, as part of some of our reflections about this innovative approach, we've seen that cartoon illustrations can really be very effectively be integrated into the development of IC materials, uh, which can be used to raise awareness about entities at the community level. Um, they also are, are veritable tools for improving healthcare workers' knowledge of N. Today. We've also seen that these illustrations can provide reliable stigmatizing and discriminations can help non-discriminatory manner. Next slide, please. Um, next, next slide. Okay. Finally, visual methods such as these cartoon illustrations can help to really bring research findings to life, as data are often displayed in much more digestible and visually appealing manner compared to the more traditional approach where we use tables and bar chart, which can be, very, be very, can be very abstract and difficult to relate with. These innovative visual methods often also encourage open discussion between researchers, program implementers, as well as program planners. It also would, you know, can be adapted in IEC material designs for raising awareness about NTD at the community level. Um, in the running, to round off this session this afternoon, I'm going to um, show, play you that short video clip that we talked, uh, that I talked about earlier on so that you can get to see how that clip looks. I really hope that you do enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Neglected tropical diseases are those such as leprosy, river blindness, and elephantiasis. There are many people suffering from them in Nigeria. Untreated NTDs can cause symptoms like very swollen limbs or scrotum, ulcers that won't heal, skin and bone changes, and blindness. These symptoms can be severe and in some cases lifelong. NTDs are caused and spread by tiny organisms and insects, not by witchcraft, spells, or curses, or from interacting with affected people. So, Taking persons affected with NTDs to traditional healers or prayer houses is not a lasting solution. You can support them to get the nearest health facility to receive available treatment and advice. Free medicines are available at the health facilities. Health workers can teach you how to care for your swollen limbs and support you with items to continue at home. Surgeries for persons affected by hydrocell as well as management for relief also are available at the hospitals. NTDs are not contagious, so there is no cause to stigmatize people with these NTDs. This will make them isolated and lonely and less likely to get the treatment they need to get better. Instead, be kind to them and help them get treatment. Showing them love and support will result in improvements for persons with NTDs their families and the community. Thank you so much, Martins. I'll now share our final presentation from Countdown. Let me just share my screen again. So thank you, Georgina and Martins. Following these case studies, I will now present lessons learned from these studies and reflect on the value of visual approaches and NTD research. So what have we learned? Participatory visual methods are creative and fun, but they also can be intensive and require time and commitment. They require flexibility. And good facilitation above creative skills is actually more important in making an impact. Field workers and researchers have a role to play as facilitators in this process. Visual methods require co-production of knowledge and with that relationship building. Things to consider when choosing a visual method. The whole purpose of visual methods is to be collaborative, but what but we do need to consider whether some methods can exclude some groups. For example, in our photo voice study, there was a participant with leprosy with limited hand function. This resulted in difficulties in using the camera to take photos. So then we then included the help of her caregiver. 
Joint decision making about methods and audiences for dissemination is important. Therefore, it is essential to have informed consent. So before the project starts, all participants are aware of who the intended audiences are and the ways in which the visual materials will be shared. It is also important that visual methods are context and culturally specific. And just to give an example of working within the local context, as Martin's presented, we worked with a local artist and the discussions with the research team in Nigeria really helped to ensure that the cartoons were representative of gender and cultures. Here you can see examples of drawings of men and women from culturally diverse regions of the study sites, including traditional and cultural dress. As mentioned, informed consent is a key ethical consideration. This also highlighted, highlighted the need for us to be critically reflexive throughout the process. Validation helped this, as during the dissemination, we would continually check and ask co-researchers and community members whether we had accurately captured the key findings. Creating safe spaces for reflection was also key in the process. However, visual methods on their own are not enough to ensure balancing power dynamics, especially in multi-stakeholder settings. Dissemination activities need to be deliberately planned and structured. The workshop should be designed to be participatory and interactive, with participants having an active role. Presentations, especially led by community members and co-researchers, were a good way of engaging and actively involving participants in the workshops in Liberia and Nigeria. In this photo here in Nigeria, participants were asked to use coloured post-it notes to indicate areas depicted by cartoons to be prioritised in the intervention design. I've used the saying, seeing is believing here, as I believe it highlights the value of visual methods in sharing data beyond written methods and painting a picture of individual stories. Visual methods bring emotion back into research. Cartoons were powerful tools by enabling participants to discuss potentially sensitive topics, by depersonalizing scenarios and allowing affected persons to reflect and define their situations in their own terms. For example, this cartoon highlighted the psychosocial impact of NTDs, and this resonated with NTD program managers and co-researchers alike. Here in Hausa, the man in the cartoon is saying, I can't live like this anymore. And this was an emerging theme from the data, as many participants affected by NTD spoke of the effect their illness has had on their mental well-being. Photos also captured powerfully captured emotions. From our photo voice project, as presented by Dr. Tosin, one woman affected by leprosy photographed objects she couldn't use anymore due to the loss of the use of her hands. These photos also resonated with stakeholders at dissemination meetings where participants use these images to share their stories and highlight the challenges that they have faced. Here are some reflections from our co-researchers from the Wellbeing Project. Here, Kareem explains how photo voice allowed him to explain emotion. While Modena here reflects on how photo voice allowed her to express issues that she has been keeping to herself. And Mohammed here touches on how photos have enabled him to have a voice to share his story beyond immediate family and to wider audiences. The impact of these methods fostered the uptake of research findings into interventions which were responsive to priorities highlighted by people affected. The cartoons, illustrations and photos were so well received by stakeholders that they have been used in intervention design. For example, illustrations in Liberia were used to develop social mobilization groups and patient advocates, while photo voice was used to inform the development of support groups in Nigeria. As presented by Martins, the cartoons have been used in training materials for community healthcare workers and have also been taken forward by the Federal Ministry of Health to deliver COVID-19 health messaging. Visual methods can effectively illustrate experiences and the stories of people affected by NTGs, and they have resonated with and reached wide audiences. For example, these cartoons were used to promote the WHO webinars on disability stigma and mental health in NTDs. 
It has been a real honour to work on these projects using visual methods. We've learnt a lot as a team and the key messages from our experience are that images can be powerful. They can be recognised beyond literacy levels, culture and knowledge. They encourage interactions between non-researchers and researchers and reach wider audiences. This process also created ownership and honoured local knowledge. Visual methods help to amplify voices of people affected so that researchers and funders can learn from their experiences and prioritise their needs to shape responsive health systems. Thank you so much for listening. That's just simply incredible team countdown. Um, it's really incredible to see this much uh, commitment to creative approaches. I know there are a lot of questions and question marks that still remain on the best way to engage communities, reach out to patients, um, take neglected diseases out of neglect. And it seems to me that if uh, many more public health and research groups kind of really embedded these approaches into their thinking and into their work, we would much sooner get to um, kind of best practices and a much better understanding of what works, what doesn't work, um, and and so forth. So it's a huge commitment and a huge uh, boost to neglected tropical diseases, but also in a much wider sense to sort of um, the research methods and methodology. So thank you very much for that. Um, it, it's just been really enlightening to, to see all this. So thank you. Um, of course, you know, lots of people in the field, in this field, the tropical disease field, the medical field, are also feel kind of very compelled to bring in science communication into their work. And uh, more so recently as the means of uh, producing such material as becoming more and more accessible to all. And so I'm now working in reverse order of the program and I do apologize for that. But I thought this could be a good moment actually to uh, hear a little bit more from one of our speakers, a medic student. Um, I'd like to welcome Boluatife Adirunmu. Boluatife, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Hello, hi. Thanks for joining us today. And um, what's really interesting about yourself is that uh, you're a medic student. I'm assuming you are more than busy. Uh, you probably have exams coming up at some stage as well. And yet amidst all of that, with your uh, rotations on the surgery ward and so forth, you have still found the time and the commitment to create an animation on dengue, uh, what dengue, what we need to know. Uh, you also recently uh, had uh, created an animation on COVID-19. We're not going to talk so much about that one today, but so it'd be really great to understand and hear a bit more about how you marry the two interests in your life, which is your um, medical training, as well as your, um, uh, your gift really for animation. So perhaps um, you can tell us a little bit more about your approaches. So, um, hello everyone, um, we'll to start the room. I'll be sharing my video first with my animation so we can understand the, uh, what the video is about and I'll be quite to share my experience. Thank you. Start
Uh, you got a lot of emojis there, power emojis. <laughs> I think you've got some fans in the audience. Um, lovely to see you and welcome, Roleo, Praise, uh, Anna Georgeson as well. Thank you so much. I'll be presenting my work on creative approaches to support research and disease control. I am Blood Fred Romo, emotional designer, a final year medical student at the University of Ibadan, and also a student ambassador of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. I'll be discussing my journey towards uh, my towards animation. Well, so I started my um, journey um, towards making animation um, during this lockdown, the COVID nineteen pandemic. But it didn't really start because I have um my medical education has been quite stressful, and as medical students, we don't really have time. We usually just um, run through our clinical rotations without having um so much break so the COVID 19 um caused um, the closure of um, almost all schools especially my school and since i was already in the clinical rotation my clinical rotation and i'm um, um my most of my rotations are in the teaching hospital so we could not we could not um, continue our education because Hospitals have been found out to be super spreader for the um, virus. <clears throat> so we, we had to go home. And sadly, um, education, our education could not continue because uh, unlike other schools where they employed the use of um, online classes, virtual classes, but because of um, a particular lecturer strike that we had spanning almost a year, that was not able to happen. So it was just a whole year of break of doing almost nothing academically. So I've always thought to myself that I had a creative side and artistic side to to me, but I've not really explored that because of the rigors of medical school and because I had other responsibilities, extracurricular responsibilities, which um, included being the president of my medical student association the University of Biomedical Student Association. So the pandemic came in uh, during a time that we always wanted a break, but now it was extending beyond what we um, expected. So during this time, I decided to explore my creative art side, and I enrolled in a um, course um, on making animations, which is how I started. So I was able to match it um, with my public health interest. Um, in public health, because I always believe preventive medicine is, um, is still the best form of medicine, since it's, it's, it's less burdensome, it's cheaper, and also the more effective form of, of medicine. So I tried to, um, to use that and then make videos on um, public health issues. So I started by making a particular um, animation on a video um, about a wash pro um, project where kids um, were um, amongst themselves encouraged each other to wash their hands before um, after using after defecating um, the the how infectious diseases are transmitted if they do not um, wash their hands. So this would this helped um, them in raising their awareness. So this um, will help them prevent um, infectious diseases like diarrhea. Also, I was able to make um, a video about the COVID-19 preventive uh, measures that everyone can take um, during the um, Christmas um, holidays. Because that was a time, especially in my country, where um, we, we celebrate Christmas, celebrate holidays a lot. And, that was, and there were bound to be larger gatherings. So, um, me making that video ensured that people do not forget that there's still COVID-19 around and they have to ensure to make sure that there are preventive measures like um, hand, hand washing, like using their face mask and also avoiding large gatherings to they should ensure to keep to that 
so as to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Then after that, um, I, um, um, late last year, I had a friend, I had a friend and um, mentor who, whose name is Ifeo Romano. He left Nigeria to study medicine um, at the Caribbean. And about late last year, um, I heard uh, about the news of his death, which was really, really heartbreaking. As as medical personnel, we we experience death almost every day. We we kind of get numb to it, but sometimes when it comes close, when it comes home, it's it's it really eats us. It's heartbreaking. So I I tried to find out what was the um, cause of of his death, and um, I was quite surprised when I was told dengue fever, and that to me was was a bit strange not that i haven't heard of dengue fever but because it's not exactly prevalent in my country in my area or more like it is underreported so but then i was aware that i, I knew what dengue fever. i had this vague understanding of what it was because of having done um having experienced it in one of my medical microbiology class so um i resort to i mean read up, up about it i mean just to um know more and to see how it caused death and i discovered that it it leads to severe dengue which eventually which one of the causes which one of the um, complications rather causes only one of the co- one of the complications is death and this 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 was quite painful. So um, around this time was when I saw a um, a, a call for <coughs> entries to a, a storytelling competition about entities. So I thought, okay, I think I can tell a story um, to encourage and to also know for to make people know more about um, dengue fever to increase their awareness on dengue fever. So I made the animation about the dengue fever. So now I'm uh, moving forward to um, the description of the animation that I made. I'm um, having watched it. I've all we all watched it in the earlier part of my uh, presentation. From the from the first thing, we you can see a man um, with a smile on his face, which indicates how um, happy and healthy he is. And following that is a scene of um, a mosquito, um, the Aedes aegypti mosquito to be precise, is the more common um, mosquito that causes, that carries the the dengue fever, um, the, the dengue fever um, agent, infectious agent. And also the aegypti the Aegis aegypti mosquito comes from the from the very um, dirty part. You can see the trash and uh, and the trash can and and um, the dirty environment. I also like to uh, also like to note that the other forms of mosquito also causes other kinds of disease. For example, the female Anopheles mosquito causes malaria, which is the one which is more um, uh, which which is more which is actually endemic in my um in my region in africa in in nigeria my country to be precise so um and then the mosquito bites the the um the man and which eventually leads to his symptoms which i outlined in the next scene and then we can say also that it could cause death so um beyond all that i was able to um, talk about the um, the statistics that were that were involved in the in the dengue fever. For example, more, almost half of the population of the world's population is at risk of dengue fever, which is quite a lot, and that runs into billions of people. And also, um, I I I was able to now speak about how to prevent and how to control dengue fever. Firstly. On the individual um, stage, on individual level, and then the government level.
So for the individual ways that we can prevent um prevent dengue fever, for example, things like using a mosquito repellent, which the 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 major um goal on individual level is actually to prevent yourself from being bitten by this mosquito. <clears throat> so most of the things that people will do is to prevent the mosquito from breeding or to prevent even if they breed prevent them from from biting you so things like using of mosquito net using of um using um use of mosquito repellent and also proper sanitation of your environment things like that are, are helpful are effective towards controlling dengue fever and also controlling this uh, the breeding of these mosquitoes and now to the government level the government can do uh, much more in terms of um, increasing funding towards um, research of uh, on dengue fever and also they could also um, in fact improve the healthcare system of the country so as to on a, on, a, on a more general scale so as to be more effective towards healthcare service delivery and also um, enforcing sanitation policies and sanitation laws and a, a whole range of, of, of that would really help to control dengue fever. So we all have a responsibility to stop dengue fever. Dengue fever is um, obviously a neglected tropical disease. However, we can't neglect it because it still causes death. And even if it causes just one death, that one person has family, has friends, has goals and dreams to, to that he or she or them wants to achieve. So um, he, every life basically matters. For example, like that with my friend, he wanted to become a doctor and to advance the course of, 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 of medicine in his own way but sadly dengue fever has, has stopped that so there's a need to actually stop dengue fever because it just might be someone else it just might be someone someone else tomorrow so there's a need to make dengue fever the awareness of dengue fever more and you can do that by signing a a, um, a, a petition to have the world dengue fever day the world dengue day as it's shown on the screen so kindly go to this website and sign a petition so that we can get dengue day and have and make world dengue day recognized and we, on that day we can get to have more presence we can get to have more awareness about dengue day and action can be really put into towards stopping dengue fever with this this will go along with stopping Dengue fever. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this work. Thank you, I understand, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Bolu Watife. Um, the burden is huge. It's really underreported across the African continent. So uh, these efforts are really important and huge. And in fact, this is something that we're going to look at in more detail, hopefully, in an upcoming uh, ICNTD Connect session. So any kind of way of, on the one hand, building the evidence for the epidemiology of dengue, and then on the other hand, the awareness of it, um, when it remains really substantially underreported, well, is really, really important. So thank you for taking us behind the scenes on your journey. And you're getting lots of uh, very positive comments here. Praise is saying beautiful presentation. Uh, Ianu Olua saying I'll definitely sign the petition for a World Dengue Day. So all that's really fantastic. And just that in itself has uh, is great advocacy work there and then, um, Bolu. So thanks for that. Um, I was just wondering if anyone in the audience had any specific questions in terms of how the creative materials were made. Um, if you don't, I do definitely have many things that I, I would like to ask, so I'll just jump in. I didn't want to kind of uh, go in first, but I, I suppose what I'd like to ask everyone here um, is this very fine balance when you are creating uh, a piece of a piece of 
communication um, and as a public health person there's on the one hand kind of one end of the spectrum is really about transmitting the facts um, and as we heard yesterday uh, right at the onset of our conference sometimes scientists and rightly so can't help themselves but tell the whole factual story and somewhere in there um, the actual narrative is lost and then the other end of the spectrum is just really the pure storytelling aspect and so I just wanted to ask you all coming from very different disciplines and covering different diseases and of course creative approaches where do you feel you fit somewhere in between on that line between pure communication of hard science and on the other hand just a moment of storytelling and do you find that's a hard balance to achieve or what would be your your thoughts on this And maybe the end you could yes. start. Since you're, <laughs> I was but... thinking I can start. Yeah. So uh, there are of course different ways in in combining, com yeah, communicating uh, science and uh, uh, storytelling. And uh, one way that we did that was by um, publishing an article about this research project, but embedding the film within the article. So people could read in a very traditional way about the research and the methods and the findings, etc. But they could also, uh, yeah, straight away look into um, uh, this film and see the yeah the visualized stories of the respondents that we approached. So that's a way to uh, to combine these. There are also more and more uh, conference scientific conferences that. Uh, also invite people to screen uh, films based on research and i think that's uh <laughs> that's a very good uh, uh movement going on and i hope that will uh, i think that will gradually get more and more attention it's something maybe that is uh yeah it's still i think it's still develop developing but it will uh, definitely should be part it should always be part, I think, of story. Yeah, storytelling should always be part of the hardcore science. Yeah, to personalize what science is all about, like to remember why are we doing science in the first place, like what the aim is and for who we do that. Fantastic. And that's such great examples about quite literally embedding the link for your film in the published paper, which um, I've just put the link to that again um, up in the chat. And that's really kind of a very concrete way to marry the two approaches, or as you said, having film screenings at a scientific conference, or maybe even this ISNTD festival, which we hope tends to be more on the conference kind of side of the spectrum than just a festival. Um, Oluwatife, what about you? How are you balancing communicating the science and also telling the story? Thank you so much. I hope my audio is much better now. It's okay. We can still hear you. We have to concentrate, but we'll get there. Okay, no problem. Uh, well, uh, okay, no problem. Um, the, the relating to um, storytelling, one thing I um, most people understand is that they are not, most people are not doctors, most people are not health professionals, so they don't understand the medical diagnosis, the etiology, the pathology, so um, very people content to understand these things, which is why uh, I, I, I first of all started with the story of a young man and then I, I showed um, a, a scene where the uh, mosquito was coming from. So things like that, they understand that, oh, okay, this uh, mosquito is coming from a very dirty, in a very dirty environment, which they can relate to. They have that in their body. So it's compared to you telling them or giving them uh, a research article to, uh, to read. It's better, that's right, a creative approach to inform uh, to creating and we need to to increasing uh, to tell them more about preventive measures and also probably create measures to so it's very important to make the medical jargon for them and to make it as little as possible so that they can get what you're trying to do. 
Fantastic, absolutely. And one uh, image can really summarize a thousand words. So that's a wonderful approach. And also, if you are trying to reach a very young demograph, the animation style is probably the 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 method of choice of course it's got that kind of natural instinct um martins would yeah. you like to add to this yes right so i think you know just to add on to some of the point that has been shared already is to also understand you know the kind of audience we're actually trying to reach sometimes i believe that science should reach both the scientific community but also it should reach the layman in, in, that, in that sense. And so sometimes you want to be able to have both components available to both set of people. So like was, you know, like um, um, Leon said, um, one of the things we also tried to do was to create a blog. And in that blog was embedded a number of these um, cartoon pictures. And so it, it's, it's easy to read, you know, so like you, you just last, you, you said lastly that, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so a lot of people easily relate to those pictures, even though you're looking to see um, scientific figures and facts, but somehow there's something that makes, you know, those research findings more digestible and makes it easy for you to easily relate. And I think more importantly is the part of taking action. You know, like what we talked about, you know, the dissemination of the research findings. You know, a lot of times, People can really just sit on a dissemination meeting and it's all just talking numbers and you know, looking at graphs and pie charts, but which can sometimes be less engaging than when you present pictures, you know, because those pictures really, even though you're talking, you're speaking to a scientific community, but those pictures and those, you know, illustrations further open up avenues for discussion that would otherwise have not happened if it was just the traditional way of relaying um, research findings. So I, I guess it really does sit in between, you know, you know, um, providing um, facts and figures to the scientific community, but also being conscious that, you know, sometimes your audience may actually be mixed and you want to have something that appeals to both sides of, uh, you know, the, the coin. Fantastic. And uh, particularly with social media, it's very easy for things to kind of take on a life of their own. We saw um, Last year, when the whole world was washing their hands all the time, we saw quite a few viral TikToks or big international organizations trying to experiment with different platforms with those very engaging and, and short messages and clips. So absolutely. That, that absolutely resonates with us. Um, Shireen, Georgina, did you have anything to add? Oh, sorry, Shireen, you're muted. Oh no, it's the audio curse of this. Sorry, <laughs> can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Okay, well, I just wanted to add on to what Martins was saying. I think when we think about public health, it's really the art and science of kind of presenting people's you know, health. You know, why do you want to improve health? And that really applies to every type of you know, disease. And I think it really speaks to what Leanne was saying, that, you know, we have to think about who we're, you know, designing these, you know, why are we doing this research in the first place? And I think especially in participatory research, we really try and see, you know, it's about the co-production of knowledge. So there really shouldn't be so much of a divide between science and art, I guess, if you want to call up but you know really being able to action the change and that applies to implementation research too you know we want to move beyond just papers but actually when you want to action change we found that when you do communicate findings in a way that appeals to those people that's where you can get the research out and actually speak to the people that you know are actually affected by the research in, you know, in the first place fantastic georgina yeah hello yeah hi just just to sum up i think it helps to bring up the entire community the entire stakeholders that are involved in the activities and if you want to get people full participation you should be able to come to their level for them to better understand and we are all talking about equity we are all talking about reaching to the least 
part of the community and the best way to be able to reach to people at the bottom is to be able to meet their needs and give them information that they will be able to understand and it will be clear to them. So I think that's the best approach. Sometimes it's kind of difficult when you are thinking from a start, how can you change this science into an art? But gradually, you will be able to get there and you can achieve a lot using those creative methods. Mm. Absolutely. And um, I, I think I've mentioned this before in this conference, but here in the UK, for example, I was surprised when a senior politician uh, did say they'd used the film Contagion, the Hollywood blockbuster, as part of, you know, improving the understanding of the COVID pandemic. So you never know where a film can go or a piece of creative <laughs> material. Um, well, there was a question here from uh, Rob Dillon for you, Leanne, and I'd like to take this opportunity to say hello and salute uh, Rob Dillon, also known as Sanfly Man on Twitter from the um, University of Lancaster. Uh, hi, Rog and Viv, if you're both there. Um, Rob was asking, how did you approach Tigist to make the film? Did you first develop a relationship with her? So um, we were actually conducting our ethnographic uh, field work, first of all, at the health center of the Massive Food Project. And uh, that's where we actually first met Tigist. And um, we were talking with her about uh, how she was feeling and what happened to her and how she'd come to the health service. And um, it happened that she actually lived really far away from this health service, but that her auntie, who she talks about in the film, had uh, uh, had mentioned this health uh, healthcare service, and she was actually uh, she had travelled all the way to live for for a while with her aunt, and um, it was a very uh, it, it was a amazing moment actually because we were also there when she heard for the first time that her disease was uh, something that could be treated and that was also reversible and that was a very emotional moment as you as you can imagine i mean it's such a young girl who uh yes and she had a podogoniosis already since she was like seven so you can imagine that her whole childhood has been marked by this disease and um and I thought it was also very, I thought she was very powerful in how she could phrase her uh, experience and how she wanted to participate in this project. And later we also, when the film was finished, we also, um, tra well, actually I didn't do it myself with my colleagues uh, from the Moss Food Project, traveled uh, to her home. She was living with her parents again and they showed the film and um, she received it. Very, yeah, she was very positive about the film and very thankful. So it's, it's so it's I think it's beautiful how you can create something together and that you have like the same uh, goal in mind and she wanted to get her story out. And I think, well, uh, well, we succeeded with together with that and now it's i mean we just uh, presented the film so it's at the start of this new phase of our research in which we can we will spread her story around the world hopefully and hopefully also make this change in um, yeah for tigis but also everyone around her uh, dealing with podogoniosis and anywhere in the world of course so that's a little bit the story. <laughs> that's fantastic, absolutely. And also um, many people who are involved in a creative project, and um, that's whether it be Tigist or um, the villagers uh, involved in the photo voice project that Countdown um, have been involved in, uh, some kind of mainstream actors who end up in a film playing the part of someone who's been affected become actually one some of the most vocal activists for that particular cause and so um be interesting to see in future with di which direction tickets takes uh in terms especially if it's so it's such a widespread public health concern um so yeah it'd be really interesting to see we, we look forward to hearing more from you um uh, Rob Dylan is adding, Tigist is a good example of an expert. Um, and so, uh, how do you, 
sorry, how did the project leaders recruit co-researchers? Are they aware of their recruitment bias and how do you ensure good representation? And I suppose that's a question that uh, could be opened up to all panelists in terms of all your numerous and varied project, um, projects, sorry. Do you want me to start maybe or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> So what we, we use is this uh, snowball sampling technique, uh, yeah, con convenient sampling. So you start, uh, we started at the health center and that's where we actually met the health workers. Uh, but for the patients, uh, we, we met those who, yeah, who were actually on the spot at that particular time. Uh, we did keep in mind a little bit like um, that we got uh, different ages and we got women and men. Uh, so to make up a balance. Uh, and what you see is that the people who were included in the ethnographic film were those people who were very um, vocal, who were, who were talking very coherently, because I think it's important for the strength of a film that you do choose those participants who can really get their story good across. But then the ethnographic film is, of course, based upon a broader research where more respondents are um, uh, represented. So in a way, we made sure that, uh, th that it was a good representation for the stories we overall heard we came across during our research. Brilliant. Would anybody like to add to that? Shireen, perhaps. Martins. Hi. Okay. Um, hi, hi again. Okay, so um, I guess to touch on to the point, I mean, because most of these research methodologies are actually qualitative in nature, meaning that, you know, the sampling are oftentimes, you know, um, purposive in nature. But again, we try to have representation in all of what we try to do so that there is balance. So for instance, because some of our co-researchers for this particular research were persons who were themselves affected with entities. And so the, we were concerned about recruiting people who had the various entities in question. So, um, because we we're working majorly around, you know, skin entities, so lymphatic filariasis, that means people with lymphedema and hydrocy, as well as persons with borreli ulcer and leprosy. So our co-researchers were representative, representative from these four groups of persons with these four different entities. So that was one way to try to ensure representation. Also from the healthcare side, which we were also looking at recruiting co-researchers who were health workers, we were interested in looking at the various levels of frontline health workers. So we're looking at people who are more like in the local government or at the district level who are entity focal persons, but also um, frontline health, work, health workers at the health facilities both at the a little senior level, so these are like um, in charges of the primary healthcare facility, but also the more junior level health workers who are like the choose community health workers. So we recruited also from these two groups, making sure that we have a kind of better balance and spread across the different set of people that we are going to formulate our respondents. So I. I guess that was one of the ways that we tried to ensure some form of balance and also to, um, to, to make it, so one of the things we also tried to do was to also train them in the aspect of community-based participatory approach. And so making them understand that it was very important that people add their voices, not really shutting people down because you feel that you know more, you know, but really coming down to people's levels so that, you know, you have that avenue to really engage with, you know, your, your potential respondents. So I guess that's one way that we try to, um, create some balance in our recruitment process of co-researchers. It's basically just looking at the various angles we're interested in and then ensuring representation from each of those various angles. Brilliant, thank you. Shireen or Bolu, Georgina, any concluding words? Um, so just to really add on to what Martin said, so for all the projects in Countdown, we work really closely with the Ministry of Health and the NTD programs in the state and LGA level. So I think this relationship has really helped us kind of make connections and help us actually have access to, you know, people that are affected, um, even healthcare workers as well. And because of that, we've been able to, you know, make sure we do have a range and we always consider, you know, a gender balance, different ages, 
and um, like Martin's also said, because we're looking at, an, we're taking an integrated approach, so we ensure we have a good balance of, um, you know, personal perspective, by what are endemic in those areas in our study sites. So what we looked at, and I guess photo voice, in our photo voice project, and in that cartoonist project, we were looking at those four NTDs, leprosy, um, lipedema, hydrocele, and ulcer. So it was just making sure that we did have that. and. Um, it was also a case of snowballing to our team in um, Nigeria in the wellbeing study. They did say as soon as those um, they started taking photos in the community, they found more people that wanted to join as they found out. So I think it was really great kind of, you know, encouraging and generating interest in our research as well. And also finding access um, to people affected, you know, who were sometimes hidden in the community. And throughout that research process, actually, we were able to link, um, you know, newly detected patients and link them to the LGA and they were able to get treatment that way. So I think it was like really working with co-researchers has been a really valuable um, experience for all of us. And we've learned so much from them as well. Brilliant. Well, but dear panelists, we've gone, uh, it was so fascinating. There was so much material to explore that we have run quite substantially over our time. Uh, but that, those were some great questions from Rod. Um, and also we just really wanted to hear a bit more from yourselves in terms of the creative process. So that's been really, really helpful. And so I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for your time, uh, your extended time, and thank also all the uh, participants for tuning in today. Um, you know, we we will we've been really amazed and awed by to get the film by the huge amount of output from the countdown project. Uh, Boluwati, for your commitment to um, education and awareness building right from the onset of your, what I'm sure will be your career, medical career. Um, so on that note, again, I'll take uh, this opportunity to thank you and salute you. And uh, I hope we get to meet again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank On you, behalf Mom. of the team, we would like to say a big thank you and we wish to have oh, this opportunity. It was really exciting. <laughs> Same for us. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you so much for organizing this. It's very fascinating and I've thank learned you for a lot. The opportunity. It was our pleasure. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot, I'm everyone. Really looking forward to yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a very good time. Um, nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you, Ambolu. Great job you've done there.